October 5th, 1933, left Berkeley, Mrs. G and I, quote, on vacation with camp outfit in the Ford. That must have been his Model T. At 10 a.m., hottest October day on record. Newspapers say 92 in San Francisco, 102 in the orchards of Fresno. We saw it 88 in the cool of the bamboo-thatched watermelon booth near Sears. Saw a mockingbird with a western environs. The Grinnell Resurvey Project is named after Joseph Grinnell, who was the first director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology on campus. And he was very interested in the distribution of animals and what factors affected their distributions. So he particularly developed the ideas about how climate might shape where species are found. Here in Sierra Nevada, what makes these national parks special is their incredible elevational gradient. Um, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park has a gradient of over 13,000 feet elevation in it. And climatically, that's the equivalent of going from Southern California to Northern Alaska. So we have all these different climates packed together in a small space and all these different organisms that require real specific climatic conditions in their special little zones there. Grinnell made a trip from the Central Valley up over the Sierras through Yosemite National Park and the surrounding area and over to the east side of the Sierras. And he was looking at the change in animal life as he went up in elevation. And that change gave him kind of a proxy for how climate affected where species are found. And of course, Grinnell wrote that he thought the value of his collection would be perhaps known in 100 years, assuming the material is safely collected and stored. So we decided to start retracing where Grinnell went. And we began with his famous Yosemite transect, then Lassen National Park to the north, and then Kings Canyon Sequoia National Park to the south. And our goal was to see whether um, the small mammals and the birds that he recorded so diligently in his field notebooks have moved upslope in elevation. That's what we would expect with warming, that species would move their elevational range up as the climate got warmer and became more suitable for them further up the mountain and perhaps became unsuitable at the bottom of the mountain. But the climate change across these areas was very different. And as a result, we also saw some large differences for the species across these areas. Some species consistently showed the same change in elevation. Uh, the range retractions, for example, of the alpine chipmunk, which are, turned out to be very severe, were similar throughout its range. But others were moving upslope in some places and downslope in others, or didn't change when it changed in Yosemite and Kings Canyon, but not in Lassen. And funny things happen. Species interact with other species. And those species interactions through competition and predation can sometimes limit the range of species. So some of the changes that we've seen through the Grinnell Resurvey may well be reflecting changes in species interactions. Maybe the climate didn't favor one and that species declined and another one took its place, maybe even moving down to take its place. So we began to realize that Climate change was a lot more complicated than some of the simple expectations that everything will get heated off of mountains. One of the purposes of the national parks is to protect biodiversity. And biodiversity is made up of species, species composition, how they're arranged structurally, and how they function relative to biophysical processes. So when we're looking at options for the future, it seems to me that one of the things we're going to have to do is make sure that that component, that balance between composition, structure, and function, that relationship is better understood. And that's really something that science can help us with. It will help us decide which species will potentially thrive in the future and which we simply have to accept our goners.
If you're a superintendent or another decision maker, you need two classes of information. You need values and you need facts. And without either of those, you're sort of in a bind. The values tell you where you want to go. The facts tell you whether you're getting there or not. So science's role is to give you those facts. Science does not give you the values. Those come from policy and law. Science is telling us that change is occurring. But my big question is, so what? Why does that matter? And I'd like to be able to have conversations with the public, other employees, peer groups, about that question. I think it's the key question right now. And what it, what it really comes down to is what we care the most about. When we really care about something, we'll make an effort to conserve it. But what happens when you get into a changing climate is that there's going to be winners and losers. And as a society, some winners are going to be really great for us. And some of the losses are going to be so distressing, so depressing, that it will be hard to come to terms with. And it's this conversation that I think is more important right now than just looking at the science. It's using the science to paint a picture of what the possible futures can hold. I think one of the messages um, that's probably important to understand is that the, the climate is changing, but it's also changing in somewhat unpredictable ways. The parks are really going to be important areas for future refugia in climate change. And that they can connect to other kinds of habitats elevationally or uh, through a north-south kinds of connections, I think are going to be very important to be able to allow plants and animals to move in response to this changing climate. So having tools like that that marry science and our view of the world doesn't tell us what the future will hold, but it gives us an opportunity to prepare for novel futures. And those novel futures, in many ways for me, are exciting. It's, it's when you, if we could get the public to be engaged in that conversation and see that excitement, the probability that we would see things that we've never seen before, rather than be depressed that we're going to lose a species here or a system there. I think that's very powerful in helping people appreciate the parks.